I'm the executive director of the Blue and Cultural Advisory Group, uh, and I'm very pleased to be moderating this afternoon's panel on uh, uh, cultural institutions uh, in the context of a leadership, creative leadership summit that we're here that, uh, to attend today. Uh, we have a, a very diverse and talented pal uh, panel of people, and uh, in order for you to get a sense of just how interesting they are, I th I'd like to ask them to introduce themselves to you uh, so that I don't mispronounce anyone's name, but also uh, they, they're all working on uh, very topical and interesting things at the moment. I thought we'd take a minute to let everyone introduce themselves and then uh, address a number of issues uh, that I've brought to the table and they have and uh, then turn it out uh, to all of you for discussion towards the end. So I'm actually going to start at the far end of the table uh, and work our way back towards me. So if the panelists all the way at the end of the table could introduce themselves. Okay. Uh, this gentleman's name is Yuan Shi Quan, and uh, he's an uh, environmentalist in the United Nations, and uh, now a delegate from China. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Chu. I'm the Museum Director and Senior Vice President of Global Arts and Cultural Programs at Asia Society here in New York City, up on Park Avenue and 70th. And my responsibilities are, of course, the museum program here in New York, as well as facilities in Houston and Hong Kong. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. It's been an exciting conference so far, I think, um, especially, there are just so many different panels that have been fascinating. My name is Kathy Doyle. I'm chairman and CEO of Doyle New York, which is an auction gallery based here, primarily in New York City, um, on the Upper East Side, on East 87th Street. We host approximately 45 auctions a year, and we are a global marketplace, although we are based in New York City. Uh, good afternoon. My name is David Ross. <clears throat> I'm a recovering museum director. Uh, for 30 years, I worked as a curator and, uh, and director of several uh, American art museums, including the Whitney Museum of American Art, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. Uh, <clears throat> subsequently, I started the Artist Pension Trust with two partners. We run uh, a pension trust for artists in eight centers around the world, um, Beijing and Mumbai and, uh, and, uh, and um, London and Berlin, New York, London, uh, Los Angeles, Mexico City. Uh, for the last four years, I've been uh, running a um, graduate program at the School of Visual Arts in New York City that is addressed to um, older artists who are trying to rethink the nature and direction of their practice. Uh, I'm Jane Rosenthal. Uh, first, uh, I'm very honored to be here with all of you. Uh, I've actually questioned why I was invited um, here. I'm a film producer. Um, I've done everything from um, Wag the Dog to The Little Fockers. Um, I also do television shows. Uh, I've partnered with uh, Robert De Niro for the past uh, 23 years, um, CEO of Tribeca Enterprise. After 120 days after 9-11, uh, we started the Tribeca Film Festival to really bring people back downtown to give our neighborhood, our community, a new memory. Um, we are now going into our 12th year of the festival. I'm on the board of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum and on the programming committee for the museum, which we will finally start um, const uh, continuing construction on. Now, um, I also, uh, with Sheikha Mayasa from Qatar, uh, co-founded the Doha Tribeca Film Festival, and we are going into our fourth year uh, in Doha, in case you'd like to come in November. Uh, Colonel Matthew Bogdanos with, the New York, uh, with both the United States Marine Corps and then more locally, the New York County District Attorney's Office. I have some limited experience primarily in the recovery and restoration of cultural heritage, and more importantly, as a native New Yorker, I absolutely love the Tribeca Film Festival. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, our topic today is culture beyond borders, uh, institutions, and uh, what 
I think in the context of this conference uh, is interesting to look at is how the traditional role that institutions have played in the presentation of cultural objects and cultural heritage uh, is necessarily evolving and changing uh, in a world increasingly dominated, as we hear over and over again, by technology, uh, shifting audiences, uh, <clears throat> but also shifting perceptions of geography, accessibility to information that uh, formerly was privileged and rarefied and is now uh, out in the general uh, uh, world of both consumption and production. Uh, and uh, as well, what the, uh, what the role of a, uh, an institution is in a post-colonial society uh, where formerly uh, the exotic treasures of countries um, dominated or owned by uh, uh, colonial powers have now uh, become uh, powers in their own right uh, and how the ways in which we present cultural heritage uh, of other countries uh, has changed or is impi impacted by that global and political shift. And finally, uh, how the uh, tremendously powerful marketplace uh, for cultural objects uh, has become a force that not only uh, drives capital uh, and finance, but has also uh, increasingly been a factor in shaping uh, audiences' perceptions of cultural heritage and cultural histories uh, in a much more powerful way, I think, than, uh, than ever before. Uh, and maybe uh, to uh, get the ball rolling, I'd like to uh, start with the role that the market now plays uh, in determining the importance of certain uh, works of art, artists, uh, how public perception uh, of cultural heritage is now shaped perhaps more by the marketplace, and that's maybe a provocative uh, way to open it up, as well as um, uh, with the phenomenon of looted uh, and stolen objects. So, I don't know, David, if you'd like to. Well, you, you, you've uh, hit on a real sore point for me, because um, <clears throat> I, um, I love art. I've spent 40 years thinking about very little else but art and my family from time to time, but art primarily. Uh, and I hate the art world. Well, what does that mean? It means that I hate the fact that in the minds of most people, the price of art, the art market, the value uh, <clears throat> uh, that people want to place on art based on its, uh, on its rarity and, in, and extrinsic dollar value has come to replace all or most other thinking about art's place in our lives and art's role in culture. And I find that incredibly saddening. And it's one of the reasons that I'm happy no longer to be running an art museum. Even though I love museums, I love works of art, the pleasure of working with a great museum and a great collection is hard to describe, it's so great. But the, the pain I feel when I, when I meet young artists who believe that art is really about a career in which you are able to make a great deal of money by making something that some people will want and by making it really well and competing really carefully and aggressively in a world of people who see the buying of art as a blood sport. Uh, no offense to the auction market, and in fact, I think Doyle does a wonderful job of being very careful about that, but for the most part, the auction market has become a blood sport where people show how powerful and rich they are by buying things for ridiculous prices that have no value, no relationship to, to real intrinsic value of art. So for me, the art world is, is something that will continue to exist whether I like it or not. The art market will continue to exist and thrive. There's trillions of dollars at, in flow. It supports all sorts of corruption in, 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 on so many levels uh, that continues to, uh, to permeate the art world at absolutely every level, uh, that uh, it's shocking. But on the other hand, who cares? I mean, who cares? Uh, will we ever see an expose about that? No, because nobody really cares about that. Uh, the fact of the matter is that that the, the monetary value of art is a sexy and wonderful thing to talk about. It makes the front page of the New York Times whenever a new dollar value is reached for a, for a modern painting or for any work of art. <clears throat> but the poetry, the spiritual value, the, the notions of community, the idea of art's real purpose is rarely discussed and, uh, and has really no place in the public discourse. And so for me, my answer was to start then working with artists, young artists again, or older artists who have found that maybe they've lost their way and want to find their way back to making art for reasons other than commerce. And 
Don't wait for me to tell you it's okay to speak. Jump okay. in. I think I have to jump in here. Yes. <laughs> um, number one, the mass media certainly has addressed the dollars and cents because let's face it, we are in a money-driven society around the world. Everyone's looking at the dollars and cents. So you're going to see the headlines of you know, a contemporary work of art selling for whatever because it's, that is what's going to catch people's attention. However, we in the auction business don't look at this as a blood sport, and I urge you to read um, very thoughtful publications that address the entire world of art and auction, and art info is, art and auction rather, is one of those magazines. Ben Ginocchio is the editor-in-chief, and it's published by Louise Bluin's company. But it is a thoughtful examination of different aspects of the art business and the auction business around the world. It, I was just saying to Melissa, it takes me a long time to read that magazine because there is so much information in it and you really have to spend time learning it. The same is true with regard to what we do in the auction business. We handle estates um, every single day of the week. So we're dealing with families, we're dealing with banks and law firms, we're providing the estates for um, for probate purposes, for court, and the wonderful thing about it is that we can bring to life collections that have been lost, we can discover property that has been stolen, and I will give you as we go along some wonderful stories. The entire auction business is based on stories, but, but as David has said, the problem is that the dollars and cents have taken over because there are art, global art funds all over the world. Certainly China has, um, by building up all, the, all their art funds, has um, you know, made it much more complex, but the United States, the banks, the um, investment banks, a lot of the hedge funds have been investing in art. So that has sort of changed the picture, but it doesn't take us away from our primary mission, which is looking at each work of art, not just the gazillion dollar work of art, but every single category of art and antiques, um, jewelry, books, coins, bronzes, ivories, jades. There's, there's a huge range in the collecting world, and and the auction business serves as a marketplace to help educate and inform and provide the opportunity for the sale of these things. So I'll leave it there so you can. Yeah, David, actually, I'd, um, I think to some degree your comments on the market and the fact that everyone is quite obsessed with prices at the moment is true. Um, you know, there are, on the Asian art side of things, there are certain artists, in fact, when, when a number of Chinese artists reached above the $1 million mark for their paintings, all of a sudden, collectors around the world start, and a different type of collector started to really pay attention. It was like then blue chip collectors, who were usually only interested in blue chip art, we're all of a sudden very interested in Chinese artists. So I think to some extent we have a situation where, yes, there is this um, other kind of interest um, and the value of art um, is usually recognised in terms of its financial value rather than its value, rather than its value in terms of um, representing history or culture or other kinds of ways of talking about art. But I would caution also in totally decrying this period of time because on the one hand, there is a, a fair degree of nostalgia on the part of curators and museum directors on, you know, before the market. But I would say that if you look at Asia and the recognition of Asian artists, especially those from China and India and the emerging markets, this has been um, an extraordinary boon for them. When mm. I first started to visit China, even those artists who um, had some degree of outside external market for their work, the political pop artists like Yue Min Jun and Wang Guangyi and, um, and others, um, they were still living in fair, very, very modest circumstances and circumstances that we would consider here in the United States to be poverty stricken. So I would say that the market has improved the life circumstances for many artists um, in the developing world in parts of Asia and has also given them enormous opportunities to expand the audiences for their work through now the development of private museums and now even more so on the public museum front in China. You know, I, I would have to agree with both of you. I think the fact of the matter is that, for instance, the auction houses really support connoisseurship, which is a beautiful thing. 
I mean, you know, connoisseurs, uh, especially amateur connoisseurs, who just spend their life trying to understand subtle differences that make one thing better than another, or a more representative example of an artist's work of a particular period, is a fantastic thing. It takes study and dedication and an eye and thoughtfulness. And, and of course, there are a great number of articles and magazines and scholarly journals that address themselves to connoisseurship, as well as to the ideas that are intrinsic in art. So I don't mean to say that I don't attack all the media at all. I think even in the New York Times, you'll often find an article that deals with ideas <laughs> uh, and not just money. Uh, but uh, And in China or in India uh, or elsewhere in the world where artists who have been previously impoverished now have money, I think it's great. Even when bad artists make money, I think it's great. You know, we can't have too many artists and we can't have too many rich artists in the world. It's not like too many lawyers. There are already too many lawyers and too many rich lawyers. But too many rich artists will never be a problem. Even the worst artists, when they get rich, it's fine with me. The problem is how we think about art and, and how our discussion uh, moves forward when we talk about what it is artists do. You know, it's still sad when Young Min Jun, for instance, uh, makes a great deal of money and then continues to make the same painting and continues to make the same painting. Or any artist who gets lured into the commerce and just makes the same work over and over and over again. And they just make a factory of making nice looking stuff for people's walls. Okay, it's, it's better than making guns and bullets. It's better than the arms industry. It's better than a lot of things that are out there. But it's not necessarily as good as that artist could do if they were driven by something beyond the market. Excuse me. Um, what did you mention to me privately that you said that Avedon had said to you? <clears throat> what Avedon said to me is that artists should rip themselves off. And I think that's true. Uh, he said a very smart thing. I mean, he did his commercial work so that he could make the work that was meaningful to him without any interference from anybody. And he spent most of his life making art. It was very late in his life that the museum world recognized him as an artist. They just thought of him as a fashion photographer for most of his life. Uh, but he knew why he was doing what he was doing. And you're right that an artist who just sells a lot of stuff, if they're also making art that's meaningful them to them, then they're clever really clever and doing what they want. And one can hope that's what, what they're doing. <coughs> Thanks for calling me on that, Jane. Uh, there's another side to this, though. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the level of the marketplace that's in operation today encourages uh, a proliferation in uh, inauthentic works being introduced into the market because there's, a, there's an increased demand for things, uh, and the supply is only so large. Uh, and what that encourages uh, are proliferations of forgeries and also looting. Uh, and, and I think it alters the perception that some people have on the sanctity of cultural property um, and it becomes a luxury asset or an opportunity to get rich. And uh, actually, Colonel, this might be a good place for you to step in and uh, introduce uh, your background with uh, uh, Iraq. Yes. Um, and if I can get that up, uh, Matthew was kind enough to offer me the opportunity to show you just a couple photographs and allow me, if you will, to offer you a slightly different perspective on the importance of art and cultural institutions. And I use um, Iraq as a case study. I take you back to the horrible days of April of 2003 when combat raged throughout Iraq and as the regime fled, leaving in the wake of its flight lawlessness and looting everywhere. It was truly as if 30 years of living under that regime had suddenly erupted in a single cataclysmic and catastrophic moment of total violence. Sadly, one of those targets was the Iraq Museum, home to the single finest collection of Mesopotamian antiquities the world has ever seen, over 500,000 separate, separate priceless relics to our shared cultural past. And the world react, watched in horror as the cultural patrimony of a nation, indeed, one would argue, of a world was completely destroyed and looted. And what was missing? Read right, like a who's who in any course in art history, the sacred vase of Orpha, believed to be the first naturalist depiction of human life in stone. A Sumerian piece was stolen, as was the golden bull's head from the golden harp of Ur. When I heard about this, I realized I had previously heard of Ur, birthplace of Abraham, patriarch to all three major religions, in whose name so much blood was being shed in the Middle East. Another reminder that we have far more in common, due to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, than the bloody headlines might otherwise lead you to believe. And it occurred to me that this kind of cultural heritage and attending 
to this cultural heritage and to art in general might offer us a bridge, and certainly in my experience in the, in the Middle East, a bridge, maybe the only bridge, to our common humanity among people with different perspectives and different views on the world, but with the same fundamental transcendent view of art. And so, uh, I happened to be in Basra at the time in charge of um, a, a task force uh, conducting combat operations. I volunteered my team to actually uh, begin to conduct the investigation and hope to return to the Iraqi people all of the looted and, and stolen uh, antiquities. Um, it was a journey, I had no idea at the time, that would last more than five years, uh, covered more than 19 countries. But as I began living and working with the, and with the Iraqi people, I, I learned that they're remarkably warm and hospitable people, people who invited me to their homes and their parks, something that will stay with me forever. And we immediately began to uh, announce an amnesty program. And anyone who ever stole anything in Iraq could return it without fear of recrimination or retribution. And also a public education program, trying to explain that these treasures were theirs. They did not simply belong to Saddam Hussein. And we watched month after month, year after year, how pieces of cracked alabaster with funny writing on them worked a magical, cathartic charm over an entire nation and an entire region, and thousands upon thousands of pieces were returned day after day, week after week, um, and recovered. And the question, my question was, how could such a people, how could such an extraordinary people have done this looting in the first place? How could they have stolen from their own archaeological sites, from their own cultural institutions, from their own museums? And I learned that the museum itself had been, and all the cultural institutions had been closed for 20 of the previous 24 years, never open to the general public. Hmm. And so the Iraqi people had no sense of pride, no sense of ownership in their own cultural heritage, and they reacted accordingly. And I asked myself then, and I ask you today, had their cultural institutions been open? Had the educational component to art been promoted? Had there been a free trade in antiquities in Iraq? Had there been auction houses in Iraq and galleries? Would the looting have happened at all? And so I offer this perspective from having spent so much time in a country that whose government and whose institutions were not open to the public, is that maybe one of the true purposes of cultural institutions, of galleries, of auction houses, of collections, to foster pride and ownership in these antiquities so that they are treated with respect? And is it also a reminder of the wisdom of Sophocles, who in 5th century BC Athens told us, he who neglects the arts is lost to the past and dead to the future. Thank you. <laughs>
in particular, or the Middle East in general, and one of the answers is all of the above. You should always pick all of the above. <laughs> You'll never be wrong. Um, people stole things to protect them. They stole things because they wanted them. They stole things to, to sell them. They stole things to destroy them. Mm -hmm. It just went on and on. Um, but the lesson that we certainly learned, um, and I can tell you it's a lesson the U.S. military and the U.S. government learned and took to heart, is that once you foster the belief and the understanding in the importance of cultural heritage, the people whose heritage it is become your greatest friends and your greatest allies in the return and the recovery of the property. And that was certainly true in Iraq. I, I, you know, I and Afghanistan. The same, the same thing happened in Afghanistan. You know, I, think that, I think that's very true, and, you know, except for the, the tragic destruction of the, the giant Buddhas in, in Bamiyan by the Taliban, which is one of the great, uh, one of the great evil acts of the last quarter century that didn't involve the killing of actual human beings, but involved something, you know, some, some murder on another level. Uh, we can, I think, as Matthew was saying, look throughout history. I remember when I was at Berkeley, there was a great professor, Walter Horn, who was part of the, uh, the uh, team that recovered uh, loot that the Nazis had stolen uh, during their reign. And as a young art historian and soldier in, uh, in the European theater, he spent years finding you know, uh, great pictures. And of course, in the auction business, over the last 20 years, many works that were also stolen by the Nazis or forced into <laughs> sale by, by the Nazis have come back to their rightful owners. Another good value, reason for the transparency of the auction That's world, correct. which has, which has <laughs> real value. But, uh, you know, at, at museums do play this function. But I think there's the other side of it that we have to recognize also. And when I first got a reputation as a jerk in the museum community, which was early on, as you might imagine, <laughs> Uh, uh, was uh, when I was asked to speak at the, uh, at the Brundage Collection, which is a great Asian collection, now part of the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Uh, and I guess I was a 25-year-old curator, and I said, why, does, why do we have the right to have all this material in our museums in Cleveland and New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles when it was taken by means that were not necessarily fair trade? either by military trade, uh, military action, or just by using capital in a way that was inappropriate uh, to the market at that moment. What now, why do we, in 1974, why do we have the right to have this material? Shouldn't we be offering it back to the countries from which it was expropriated inappropriately, or at least offering to negotiate return or, or joint use of this material? And boy, oh boy, did I make a lot of enemies really quickly in the room that day, because they said, if it wasn't for the Cleveland Museum, the great treasures of China and Japan and India would have been lost and ruined. And, and I said, yeah, it's true. That's true. There were times when those things were at risk. But now, now that we have stable governments and intelligent and uh, you know, men and women working in these places, shouldn't we be offering, shouldn't the Louvre be offering, shouldn't the National Gallery and the, you know, the British Museum be, be offering to enter into negotiations with the people whose heritage was uh, inappropriate, uh, inappropriately expropriated and, and brought to people, like you're saying, uh, uh, who, would, uh, who would have pride, whose children would grow up seeing their own culture and seeing the great treasures of their culture. And I, I still feel that way. Yeah, I, I still, you know, as much as I love these museums, I still feel you know, a little guilty when I walk into the Met and I see these things that I know were uh, brought into the Met by not necessarily illegal means, but... Uh, let, me, let me respond just to that David. single point. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Please, please. I, I, no, Matthew, you go on, um, but I'll address but, David. I mean, I, I, I've spent a fair number of years being shot at in returning <laughs> um, and recovering in antiquity, so I think, I think I've, it's clear where my heart and soul is in this regard, but it, it's fair to look at the other perspective were it not for extraordinary Sumerian and Assyrian collections, let's say, in the Met, mm -hmm. for sure. example, clearly acquired under practices that today would, it, would might get in the op-ed page of the New York Times. We're, <laughs> we're in agreement on that. But were it not for those collections, do we risk having an entire generation of people here in the United States who think of Iraq only in terms of the bloody right. strife and struggle that has taken place 
since 1980 when they had the war with Iran, or 1990 when they invaded Kuwait, or 2003 with our war. And isn't there a value to, to people saying, wait Great a second, value. that Iraq is more than that, they are the cradle of civilization, the land between two rivers. Look what they create. Look what the Assyrian civilization created. In addition to the chariot and the warfare, look what else they created. So, I mean, there is there's. You walk into the galleries at the Met now; those fabulous new galleries that deal with all that material from all those cultures, yeah. and it's just overwhelming the, the the beauty and the intelligence and the culture. And and I love museums for that reason. I'm just saying, at a certain point. And I think that point has actually occurred, and you know it's true, that most of the great museums are now, most of the great curators and museums are now in active dialogue with uh, yeah. nations, especially when they still exist. I mean, what are you going to do with the Sumerians? Yeah, point, I mean, I know? think both, both Matthew and David have raised some very important issues that face museums now in the 21st century. Cultural property and heritage are the most important issue that encyclopedic museums are dealing with today. And I have two anecdotes that illustrate this. Um, one is that the first is that when we organized our exhibition of loan works from Pakistan last year, which was a Buddhist material from Gandhara, third century, there were a lot of people that wondered why we were working with Pakistan at a time when US relations were at an all-time low, and it was also against the backdrop of the assassination of Osama bin Laden. So we were very interested in showing another dimension to our understanding of Pakistan today, that here was this ancient culture, Buddhist culture, that was very open society, um, against our understanding of Pakistan in the post-9-11 war as mostly associated with terrorism. So I think that our ability to work in partnership with other countries, especially when we show another kind of um, history to them in terms of the media representation of these countries is a very important one. The other thing about museum collections is that, of course, all museums today are very sensitive about where works come from. In fact, all museums signed on to an association of art museum directors um, guidelines towards collecting antiquities. But I think more than anything else, we have to um, start to think about world culture in a way Matthew very poignantly described it as a universal, it's not just one nation's culture. And I think if we think in that way, it kind of opens up possibilities rather than only being about ownership of that proprietary museum. So for example, within our own Asia Society Rockefeller collection, we have a very important work, an Inse vase, that is considered a national treasure in Japan. Mr. Rockefeller, when he acquired it just after World War II, had to get special permission from Japan to export it. And the Japanese authorities deliberated over this because they were, they were obviously releasing a very important work to their own cultural heritage. But in the end, they decided that they would allow it outside of Japan precisely because they felt that Americans and those outside of Japan had to understand Japanese culture in the post-World War II environment. So I think that there, this is a highly sensitive area where we're talking about cultural property, but I think we also have to change our opinions on it. In the auction business, this topic comes up every day of the week because things, our basis is exactly what the museums is, which is the scholarship of research of the items that are being offered um, at the museum to be seen or offered at the auction gallery for sale. So the research that's involved in this um, has to do with clear provenance, clear title. Um, where did this work come from? And I cannot begin to tell you how many things are identified certainly at our gallery and around the world. Um, things that were lost um, in after World War II that pop up in New York or in other places around the world. We find ourselves working with embassies in different parts, cultural ministers in different parts of the world. That's the beauty of the internet. That's the beauty of transparency and integrity of the company that you're working with. We feel really strongly about getting these things that have been missing back to their rightful owners. Uh, recently, in this past year, we identified a, a bronze bull 
um, that was somewhere out of state, and and someone you know who owned it sort of casually said, "Well, this could be stolen." So. We looked into it, and sure enough, about 40 years ago, this bronze bull was stolen from a park in Chicago. Um, one of the things, so it is now safely back in restoration and will be um, brought back into the park in Chicago. One of the aspects of business that has changed dramatically, um, both in the museum world and the auction world, which we talked about a little bit, is the whole art law field. The art law field, when um, you know, 25, 30 years ago, was not as um, uh, engaged in the process of museum work and auction work as it is today with artists' rights as well. Um, what can you publish? What can you not publish of an artist's work? And also there are debates. I mean, there's so many rights that are involved in um, works of art and, and who owns them and how can you sell them. And one of the questions um, that was Michael asked was having to do with the sale of things from museums. Um, and who has the right to make that decision? And um, what if the city in which this work of art is located really wants to keep that work of art, but they've sold it to another state um, or another museum in another state? Sometimes the local community, be it New York City or Philadelphia, wins and the work stays in that locale, and sometimes they don't win. So there are lots of issues facing um, the art world that are very complex with regard to the ownership and moral rights. Um, What's, what is the good? What is the right thing to do? Um, and integrity is one of the, the bases for our business um, that is so important to ha solving these problems. I'm hoping that um, someday some of these things will appear from Iraq in the auction market because if there's a database we can go to or someone who knew that collection who can say, listen, this is from the museum in Iraq and this has to go back to the museum, nothing could make us happier than to find that thing and return it to um, the museum. We had something dropped on our doorstep a few years ago, um, and David, you will, might remember this, just out of the blue, two paintings on the doorstep of the gallery, returned to owner. They were two paintings from the San Francisco Museum of Art that someone had stolen many, many, many years ago, of course, um, and so naturally, we quickly you know, sent them off to um, San Francisco to the museum once they were identified, authentic, authenticated. Um, one of the big unknowns is um, the Gardner Museum in Boston, Art Heist. Those works have never been discovered, so we're still waiting to find those. Well, I know it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this raises a point I wanted to uh, bring up, which is the, um, the moral obligation of museums on the one hand, but also whether at this point in history, um, collections should be an absolute fixed and static idea. Um, should museums be expected to hold on to cultural property in perpetuity? Uh, or is uh, there another way to look at it where um, cultural objects should be in free play and that museums have a responsibility perhaps uh, to release that material back out into the public realm and so that they don't wither and uh, simply sit in an archive for posterity, whatever that may be. You want to try first? Yeah. Well, um, so maybe you're well, Dr. Yuan? I think, yes. I think Dr. Yuan. Because this time of speaking is more than two times, so I want to make sure that you have to consider your own choice. So Yuan said that he always has much more to say, so he will think, so, think. Usually, so, think will think, usually think more time, and then speaks a little. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, I have been working in the art industry for about 60 years. 60, 60, 60 years now. As um, so far, he has worked with arts for almost 60 years. Uh, I have been working with arts for almost 60 years. When Louis was here, he was here to this place. It was because of the art industry and with our community. 因为雕塑作品跟会有些作品是不需要翻译的。嗯哼 ，And this time he was caught by Louis, uh, because he's focused on sculpture, which is more interchangeable and universal rather than other type of arts. 啊，刚我做一个是，因为我在这来谈一下一个艺术家，我还是艺术家，我谈一个艺术家应该怎么在这个社在这个社社会上应该怎么办。
。我首先认为一个艺术家呢，啊、呃，我观察多年，他第一个，他只是火箭的推进器，而真正真到达月球的，是华山和经纪人。嗯哼。And、uh, his major point is that,、uh, how would he act as an artist? Uh, because most of arts artists are、uh, inventor and discoverer, but the one who really reach the moon and can walk on the moon are the media and、uh, and all auctions that we have seen. Ah, a artist should be very concentrated, like a Christian work, like a Christian work, every day on the battlefield, on the battlefield. 同时的呢，也要希望这个世界呢，尽量的稳定和平一些。嗯、mm -hmm. um, ，As an artist, he hoped that everyone will get rich. You keep your own, you maintain your own financial,、uh, you solve your own financial problem as an artist, basically to to survive. But in addition, he hoped that the world will have more peaceful moments, and he has a heart that always wish. To achieve peace. Ah, if this world goes to shit, if the world is now going to shit, you think about it. The best painting is just a wooden piece of wood. Because without、uh, a peaceful environment, uh, because without a peaceful environment, any kind of artwork, including sculptures, can be burned and destroyed by people in in wars. 今天布鲁恩跟我的合作呢，我觉得是很有意义的。他第一个呢，就是让艺术家用自己的作品，跟通过布鲁恩，然后跟企业家结合，通过拍卖，然后把这些善款呢回报于回报于公益，回报于人文，回报于环保。嗯哼 ，And、uh, the significance he comes this time to Berlin is to pay back to the world by selling his artwork. And to pay back to the world,、uh, to the world, not through just money, but through humanity, through his heart, through all his good wishes. Because why? 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 When he saw these books, he suddenly remembered.、Um, Aristotle had said, "Like all artworks, are、uh, belong to human nature and are established based on human nature." Ah, we now, all the artists, artists, in the help of Ben's help, and I, have some artwork that have been linked to companies and then created a certain amount of value that they pay back to society. Okay. And so far, he has worked with、uh, other media and other companies to establish more value, not just money, but uh, uh, value that can pay back to the society. In the past. Well, this is an excellent segue then back to the question: If that's the role that、um, that art plays, and I agree that that is,、uh, what what is the moral responsibility of institutions whose charge is to Preserve, protect, present,、um, and the expectation placed on them to continue to acquire when there are limits on on an institution's ability to do so. 保护我。就是学会上他们的承载的那个责任怎么？怎么保护啊？我作为是中国收藏家协会，我也是创会的，现在是名义会长。我我觉得是应该像这样。刚才那么多专家都谈了，我们现在第一个要鉴别、收集。整理这些老的文物，要保护它、鉴别它、收藏它，而且。呃、uh, ，first of all, to protect, to collect, and to manage these、uh, artworks. So he himself has become a member in、uh, China, in one of the museum in Beijing. And、uh, he's one of the member in the United Nations Environmental and Art Association. 
，而且呢，要在大好的时光下，也是就像在布鲁恩，还有在国卫的国卫馆长，国卫刚才还有个将军，你看是我感动的，他在战争年代都能够保保护保护这个文物，学习他们这种精神。但是我们要更要利用现有的大条条件，像我们有有实的艺术家，我们要为人类、为下一代创造新文物。And not only just protect artworks and our human heritage during war, during dangerous situation, but also to carry them to the future and to our future generation to present its value to them. Jane? Um, well, first of all, I feel like I have um, no valid, um, my opinion in this, in this esteemed group. Uh, you're here, you're, you're I, valid. I, I, you're uh, well, you're, you're um, I, can't, I can't speak as an institution. Um, maybe I should, I belong in an institution. But you but, can speak um, to the issue nonetheless. But I can speak to the issue. And um, as somebody who patronizes museums, you've got, you've got the majority of the world right now is under 30, especially as there is no more, as we've now talked about, the global, looking at it as global citizens, as a global world. You had this, you know, crass, film that, I wouldn't even call it a film, that got, that shot around the world. I can't, I'm not going to speak to that whole issue, but suddenly something that happened in LA lit fire around the world. So my feeling is you've got to, every institution has to, no one has any long-term memory. We have short-term memory, but we have all these kids and we have to educate them. And how do they find their way into a museum? Why is it that they're suddenly interested in antiquities? Do you create, I, I used to go um, with my daughter to the Met and we'd run around and I'd be like, okay, let's find a cat. Let's look for the kitty in all of these different, and we'd run, it was like a race, a scavenger hunt. So my point is you've got to make it, um, you've got to make it accessible for everyone, otherwise why are we just storing it and for who are we storing it mm -hmm. and why is it just collecting dust? Well, you know, th museums have a lot of purposes and, and storage is one of them. You know, no museum is big enough to show all the things that they own, especially great museums like the Met or what have you, or the Brooklyn Museum, which shouldn't ever be neglected. Uh, <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is that there's an explosion of museums around the world in places that have never had museums before, never had the wealth to have museums before, never had the stability uh, to have museums before. And this is an extraordinary and positive thing. And I think perhaps what you're getting at, uh, Matthew, in your question is whether or not museums that do have many, many, many more things than they can show, uh, like the Met. I mean, when you go into the American galleries at the Met, for instance, now, they've done a wonderful thing, which is they're showing they have an open storage where you can see all of the chairs in their chair collection, not just the ones that they think are the greatest ones that are on view, but then you can see for yourself, here are some B and B minus and C level chairs, and you can develop your own connoisseurship and also just see more. Uh, and that is wonderful, but they still probably have 100 more chairs in storage. So why wouldn't museums with great collections uh, of paintings or of objects find ways to create more sharing. Well, the, the, good, answer, the good news is that many of them are yeah. and are finding collaborative exchanges of, uh, of collections for smaller museums around the world because the truth of the matter is that, you know, I think as we're all in agreement here, no one owns art, finally. I History mean, owns yeah. art. If we were to kind of draw a tra trajectory around museum development, um, I often think of the 19th century as Europe, the establishment of the European museums. Many of the um, previously royal collections were opened up to the public. 20th century is actually when I think America experienced some of the great museum development. If you look at most of the museums here in New York City, most of them were actually founded in the 20th century. Now if we turn to the 21st century, Actually, we're looking at museum development not being here in the States, but actually probably in Asia, where you have places like China. The Chinese government, in fact, made an announcement a number of years ago that they intend to build a thousand new museums in the next decade. And that's just on the public side. There are many other developments for private museums as well. Now, if we think about what it means to build a museum in the 21st century, yes, I think one component is around collections 
how do you build a collection in the 21st century? I think the answer is precisely what David has suggested, which is it's all about collection sharing. And I think with so many museums in Europe and the United States with a, a huge collections that are still in storage, this is one, one of the solutions, I think, to our idea of a shared kind of global cultural heritage is in collection sharing. Let me address another piece of that, which is what's happened um, certainly in the history of American museums was that people in their generosity would give their collections to museums. As the scholarship has developed, what has um, turned out to be true in many cases is that the pieces that were donated are simply not worthy. They just aren't significant in any historical way, and in fact, the quality might be wrong, or in fact, the authorship um, of the, um, who, who the artist was of the piece might be incorrect. So scholarship that we rely on, uh, which is a, a, a world body of information that is contributed to all the time, um, leads you to say, some things should be sold for museums. They're not worthy to stay, and the museums have to pay a lot of money to keep those collections, and in fact, um, what is happening in the museums these days, as David well knows, is if someone wants to contribute a collection to a major museum, they have to contribute the money to support that collection from now till eternity. That's a lot of money. So uh, museums are being very careful about what they're acquiring. And going back to what Melissa said, the sharing aspect of the property in the museum once it's been vetted and, and considered worthy is also um, in the uh, mode of being shared around the world. The other piece is that all these institutions need to, and, and many of them are, support uh, living artists and, uh, and the exhibition, not necessarily the ownership, but the exhibition and support <coughs> of, uh, of living artists in their communities and, and the community of living artists around the world being in active communication. And, and you know, that's very important. In the U.S. alone, 30,000 artists a year come out of graduate school with MFAs, just in the U.S. In China, the number must be equally fantastic. And in Europe and in Asia and in you know, all throughout Asia and South Asia and Africa, you know, I, I think it's a glorious time to be living in an art in an age where there are too many artists. That would be great. But, but institutions have a, a role to play in supporting that community and that communication. You, you, you raised a point earlier um, about who owns art. And I don't think you can argue against the proposition that there is a general movement toward the view of a global ownership of art, whatever country you're in, that clearly seems to be where the world, world my majority view is heading. But as we, we move in that direction, I think it's important to understand another component to art, and that is the art as cultural identity. And your example before, David, about Amula Omar blowing up the Bamiyan Buddha sadly proves that point. Mm. That was an intentional, an act intentionally designed to destroy the cultural identity of a people that Mullah Omar did not believe belonged in his vision, his version of Afghanistan. And it was even worse if you go back to the 1980s and 90s, sadly I do, um, in the former Yugoslavia, when the United Nations um, Blue Cross began putting up uh, signs around various sites of cultural heritage significance, bridges, churches, synagogues, mosques, each saying, you know, the, the blue shield saying, you know, this is protected by international law, it's a site of cultural uh, heritage significance, please don't target it, don't destroy it, move around it. And what sadly the, the warring factions, all of them did, whether it were Serb, Croat, Albanian, Kosovar, didn't matter, all of them began targeting those exact institutions that had been marked because they recognized what I think all of us do on some fundamental level is that cultural heritage is tied up with cultural identity. I may love the Sistine Chapel, I feel an absolute affinity for the Sistine Chapel, but it will never mean as much to me as a Greek American, as the Parthenon does. It just doesn't resonate on that level. And so there is a certain cultural identity that has to be taken into account as we move toward 
world global ownership, for lack of a better word, of art. Mm. So, um, five years ago, Sheikh uh, Mayasa from uh, Qatar had approached uh, us at Tribeca, and what she wanted to do was to create a film festival in Doha. Why did she want to do this? She wanted to do this because she wanted, A, to bring um, a certain culture uh, to Doha, but she also wanted the world to understand the culture of the Qatari people. And we have been bringing films to Doha, but the most amazing thing that's come out of the festival has really been the number of young Mideastern filmmakers that you know, we don't, we don't know, and that we are suddenly giving access to um, here uh, in the U.S. So that's been a very um, interesting cultural collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, with the time we have left, I think it would be a good point to turn this out to the audience who may have questions or points they want to make. Yes. And please wait for the microphone. My name is Yuin, and I have just graduated from Carnegie Mellon, and my major is Arts Administration. I am originally from China. Uh, I don't have any questions, but I'm very impressed by your discussions, and I have some comments. Um, I know Shanghai Museum will have a special exhibition about uh, Chinese traditional pieces with Matt uh, in the coming October. Uh, I think it's all about institution corporations, international arts exchange, and also uh, the collection sharing you are just talking about. And uh, I also uh, very agree with you that the institutions should um, focus on the arts collection itself, uh, rather than like the stolen or the uh, politic political issues. Um, we should like uh, just focus on the art side, and uh, and also I want to share my personal experiences because um, when I accompany with my friends to visit Matt, we feel a kind of uncomfortable to see all these Chinese pieces um, displayed in the hallway um, for sure. But uh, we will say um, we doubt these kind of uh, collections can be protected well if they are in China because we have uh, many wars and also um, internal like um, battles uh, in China during that years. So we will say like um, you protect our art pieces. So right now, if we have chance, can see the pieces in our own countries, we really appreciate that because arts is um, the world things, not just specifically for one nature, uh, not specific for the policy. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, that begs the question, I guess, is are museums safe places to put things if they're constantly getting looted and stolen and, <laughs> and lost in some cases? Uh, you know, I, th I think uh, it's sort of like um, these works were kind of brought into a foster home. Now they're grown up and uh, now they can find their birth families, you know, in return or at least have relationships back. And it, there's, something very, there's something very organic about yeah, it. Yeah, and in addition to that, in, in the, the early days um, when those collections were being formed, they did not have a dollar value attached to them. As we all know, the market has completely changed and things that were, you know, people were just giving away, you, you know, many, many, many years ago, decades ago, now have a market value. So it complicates the whole process, I think. There's a question over here. 我就是中国第一个在北京成立的目前就是个人最大的博物馆的观察所以我收集的东西呢一个也从香港收集了很多 okay. He added that since you mentioned uh, there are 10,000 more than that uh, museums are establishing in China and uh, so he has become one of the biggest museum uh, the curator of the, one of the biggest museums in Beijing and he has personally run to Hong Kong to collect many uh, artworks. So, this is a one who is from Hawaii, so, this one who is so, this one who is from Chowman, so, don't tell my shah ten you for shah ten my don't tell you for the yana to be a you shall. Okay, and one tip he would like to share with all of you is that uh, in the field of collection, 
he thought he thinks that it's like to buy clothes. You buy the winter clothes, jackets in summer, and you always buy skirts in winter. 比起比如经欧洲经济危机最最最近这段时间呢，我去年前年来到欧洲，用我的很多雕塑置换了在西班牙，在这个捷克，在罗马尼亚置换了几百件大众的这个呃欧洲的十八十九世纪的家具，回到了北京。And uh, so, in uh, 2010 and 11, he went to Europe and used his sculptures to exchange in Spain to exchange uh, very treasurable things back to China, which has more inner value than the market price. I prepared to invite the artists, 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 the and so he sincerely invited all of you to come to Beijing and visit his museum. Thank you very much. There's a question? Okay, this is going to sound very small after that, but um, first of all, I think that I'm not in the art world, and, and all those 30,000 MFAs coming out, they go to law school, so that's what happens to me. <laughs> um, so that's even my, worse. My, It'll come common, in handy as an artist. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a comment and a question. First of all, I think you know, the juxtaposition of politics and art has seems to be a, a theme that's run through this conversation. So the first thing, there's a, you've, you've painted an image in my mind of like Romney and, and Obama like painting it out instead of having a debate, <laughs> madly painting. Wouldn't my my question nice. is, um, what is our iconic imagery and culture of today? So we're talking about repatriating things that are so definable and so culturally relevant and specific. Now that our cultures have blended, um, you know, not just in, in in terms of a diaspora of people, but also in, in a diaspora of ideas through the internet and, and the mediums that are available to today's artists, where, what is the iconic imagery that should be repatriated or not with the museums of tomorrow? Uh, that's an extraordinary question. I think it takes an entire panel uh, to, to deal with it. But I, I mean, my short answer to that, and I'll try to keep it really short, is that I think we actually are in a period of post-national art. I don't think that we have American art or French art or Chinese art anymore. I, we think I, I think young artists around the world or artists working around the world are working in a global culture. And so that the identity issues that might have uh, taken place in previous decades or previous centuries no longer exist. And I, I think we have to look to, 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 uh, to the realm of digital art, the internet and the like to find the kind of memes that are going to you know, resonate uh, for, uh, for populations to come in a hundred years to look back at uh, this time. I do think it brings up another um, subject with regard to artists' rights, certainly what Jane is facing every day, um, what artists are. Um, they are. Artists are becoming much more active with regard to protecting their property. And there are art societies that you have to, if you're going to use their image, you have to pay money to use the image for our purposes, which is marketing and cataloging purposes. But um, so I, there, is, um, there are two lawyers specifically who have written a, a great number of books on the subject, Ralph Lerner and Judith Bressler. They've done a lot of work on the artist's rights. And you know, the fact of the matter is what one person thinks is important, another person might not. There was a famous case in California not too long ago where there was um, graffiti art on the side of a building. And the building was sold and the new owner of the building painted over half of the graffiti art. And that you would, in some places, graffiti art is illegal. And in this particular place, what happened was the community was up in arms that the new owner of the building had destroyed this work of art. And so, uh, in fact, they went to court, and in fact, they protected the rights of the artist to keep that work of art on the wall, even though it could have been considered illegal and putting it there in the first place. So it, the artist's rights are really a very interesting part of, of um, art law. So another hand up? Yes. Turn your mic on. Hello? There you ah, go. There we go. Uh, my name is Miguel Santos Neves. Um, and my question is about um, the possibility of bringing back the term cultural diplomacy. Can you speak up? Hello? Hello? There you go. Um, um, so my question was about the possibility of bringing back the term cultural diplomacy. I know it has a certain... today 
Um, uh, I, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't even let you finish cool. the question. I <laughs> so felt like I had to jump in. I feel like that's what I do every day is cultural diplomacy. Uh, I feel that when we started the Tribeca Film Festival, that was about cultural diplomacy. That was about the artists saying that we could do something and that we're alive and we're gonna, we're, we're here. Um, I think that artists can um, change the world can make a difference in places that any politician, um, any any institution can't do. The individual artist can. Um, uh, an artist who is making a difference um, in the world uh, right now is a young artist by the name of J.R., uh, whose work and actions are in over 127 different countries, whether it's Tunisia or Pakistan or India. And he is uniting people because of their similarities. And that is the one thing that when you talk a little bit about what's the iconic image globally, I don't know what it is, but I do know one thing that it is about our common humanity, that all the artists, whether you go back to Ur or any place in China, it's about the common humanity, and that's the cultural diplomacy, and that's what um, I work in every day. I think that there's an increasing role for museums to um, engage in cultural diplomacy, and I think that many museums even private ones here in the United States do that in the absence of a Ministry of Culture here in the United States. I think the US is one of the few um, developed countries that does not have a Ministry of Culture. And so many museums, my own included, the Asia Society, has taken on a kind of another role, especially since we do international relations and policy, in doing projects that would ordinarily not have happened. So when we work with Iran, we're doing an Iranian modern exhibition uh, next September. We're encountering all sorts of political issues um, relating to embargoes. Um, we have a trade embargo with that country. In fact, Canada just <laughs> signed a, tra a trade embargo as well with Iran. So, you know, I mean, we have all sorts of issues that we deal with at a political level, and museums, I think, are ideally placed to do that sort of work. No, I, I think that is what museums do. Museum curators, museum directors are, uh, are cultural diplomats. Uh, and, uh, and it is something, uh, when I was director of the Whitney, I was very proud to be representing the history of American 20th century art around the world. When we brought the Whitney Biennial to uh, Seoul in 1993, it was the first year that the South Koreans had free, openly democratic elections. It was hard to believe, because I always thought they were our ally. They must have been openly democratic. But this is the first year that really things became open. And we were there and brought an exhibition of 80 American artists and many of those artists with us to Seoul to, uh, to participate in that. And it was an amazing event. Uh, it made me very proud to be an American and also very proud to see the role that American artists could play, because they're the real diplomats, the artists themselves, living artists, are such extraordinary uh, bridges between cultures. And more than the administrators or the curators, uh, when we bring artists and put them in connection with artists in other places, real connectors are made, real bridges are built. And I, I would, uh, you know, I, I thank God that we don't have a Ministry of Culture in this, cult in this country, but I wish we had some more money to bring, to create these relationships between American artists and artists around the world. Oh, I wish we had money to keep art programs in schools. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, a good I idea, too. That. And, and in fact, oh, oh, I'm sorry, please. Oh, no, no. <laughs> on a practical level, there is a, something that's gone on that you all, I'm sure, are aware of, are the slaughter of elephants in Africa and this illegal ivory trade, which the district attorney's office has been mm -hmm. working on, trying to stop that. And to so there is there is really um, selling of ivory in New York State right this minute is impossible unless you file an application for sale of the item. So um, this is a, a situation where the world community has really um, worked together to try to um, stem the flow of these slaughters of slaughter of elephants. And to bring the last two questions together about repatriation and cultural diplomacy, it's exactly what the world attempted to do in 1970 when it established the UNESCO Convention uh, which was to determine at that point in time that any, any items of cultural heritage significance that were acquired after 1970 needed to have certain levels of provenance that previously were not necessary. 
in my Manichaean world of legal or illegal, criminal or not, we use 1970 as the dividing line. It doesn't mean you can't, you know, uh, Neil McGregor from the British Museum, give back the Parthenon marbles to Athens. It just means that in my world, <laughs> you, you don't. You had to get that in. Right? You, <laughs> it just means that in my world, you don't have to. Yeah. Because the world said 1970 as a matter of cultural diplomacy. If you have it now, okay, you know, enjoy it, you know, and please do what you can to keep it conserved. But post-1970, it's a different world. So in fairness to museums with long-standing collections and collectors with long-standing collections, the world has already spoken on, on that issue you know, yeah. relatively clearly. Yeah. And I'm, Matthew, I'm afraid we're going just, to have to leave yeah. it there. I don't mean to cut you off, Melissa. We've run over time. Uh, keep getting a sign from the back that we, they want us to stop. Uh, but obviously, this is something that uh, generates further uh, discussion, and uh, I look forward to the opportunity for all of us to do that uh, in what time we have remaining today uh, and individually as we pass each other in the hall. I want to thank all of our panelists for being here this afternoon. Thank you.